you for coming. It's always good to see you come to our History at High Noon programs. I welcome you. And as I always remind you, for you to say thank you to the library that gives us this wonderful home to have our programs. And uh, Sturgis Area Arts Council, we're part of that group too. So it's very good to have you here today. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some upcoming programs because we're scheduling pretty well through the spring. On March 20th, Ernie Miller is going to be here. And you know, Ernie collects and collects, and he's, he has so many interests, and he knows so many things about Sturgis, and he's always willing to share. So Ernie's going to come with some collections and memories, and we'll have a good time with Ernie. We always have a good time with him. And uh, on April 17th, at long last, we're going to do the neighborhood grocery stores. We've talked about it for a long, long time. And we're going to do that in a little different format. We're going to get in kind of a round table situation where you're sitting and visiting and sharing memories. We did that for Wig's lunch and it was lots of fun. And so if you have a memory of a neighborhood grocery store or a picture to bring and share, that would be a good thing. And uh, it may still probably be mostly about Sturgis because Ramona Sobers is coming and so is Lloyd Kessler and both of them have family histories in the grocery business. But uh, even at that, there's now a little red house that used to be a grocery store up on Junction that's up for sale. So all through town, there was little stores. And uh, I grew up in Rapid City, and there were some there too, so I can share a little of that. But you got to remember how we saved our pennies and our nickels so we could go buy candy yeah. at the neighborhood grocery store. So be sure to come to that, and that's in April. And so now I'm happy to introduce Mary Livingston from Whitewood, prolific writer, researcher. When you talk about three new books, that's something to have on, on tap, so it's very good. And she's been writing about the Frawley Ranch, and Mr. Hank Frawley is here today to enjoy the program, too. We welcome you, Hank, to be here with us. And so, Mary, we'll leave it to you. Thank you for asking me, and those of you that heard me talk before know I'm not a public speaker. This is just a conversation we're going to have here, <laughs> because I, I'm not really good at giving this a uh, public address. I'm going to talk about several different things, but the first thing I want to touch on is a couple of items I want to show you to encourage you to write down your memories. There's so many people walk up to me and tell me stories that they remember or places they remember, or events they remember. And I always say to them, would you write it down? And they say, no, 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 I'm not a writer. All you have to do is put down what you're telling me. And if you think about it, you're the only one that has that memory. So if you don't get it down, when we lose you, we lose those memories. And one of the things we did in uh, Lawrence County Historical Society, and I'm just giving you this as an example. I wrote the beginning, and I wrote the end of this book, and then each member wrote a timeline for a city in Lawrence County, so that no one person did all of this. It was done by eight, nine of us, and it was easy to put together. If somebody, and I keep thinking this would be a great idea for high schools, some of you maybe are high school classmates, and if one classmate would write some of her memories and somebody else would write some of his, you could wind up with a nice little story. I grew up in Rapid, and Sturgis was our big rival. And we were busy stealing your scoop, and you were busy stealing our shoe last. And we would come up, and do you remember where the basketball games were in Sturgis in those days? That little tiny gym downtown. How did all of Rapid City's fans and all of Sturgis' fans get in that little bitty room? Somebody should write about that. That that's where, because people don't believe me when I said that's where all the high school games were, is in that little building. If that doesn't interest you, I did this for our centennial. I went through the 1917 Whitewood newspapers and just cut out copied out, advertisements, and they're precious. They use words like, we've got cheap merchandise. <laughs> we would never see that today. Or don't be a piker and shop someplace else, shop in Whitewood. 
if you have an interest in something, you can put this together very quickly, and it would be another addition to the history of Sturgis or Meade County. So I really would like to encourage you to do that. I got acquainted with Hank when he took me through the school. Now, the Centennial School, which is school number 11, and as I understand it, the schools were given a number when they were created. So it was the 11th school created in Lawrence County. And some of you will know, Lawrence County then extended from Wyoming border to Piedmont. And then north, uh, Butte, the a lower part of Butte County, not half, maybe a fourth of Butte County, was also in Lawrence County. So all the schools that were created, this was the 11th school, Cook City, had school number one. Whitewood had school 66. So you know how, and, and ours, uh, they, they built them, I swear, every week there was another school. Well, the school that Hank had, that's on Hank's land, was um, uh, founded in 1888. And when it closed in 1930, or something, 32, something like that. They just walked away and left it, and Hank's dad bought it. So it had teaching supplies, the desks, uh, an old organ, and, and you walk in that school, and any of us that attended one group country schools go, oh, you know, bring back so many memories. So there's three sections in this book. One of them is about the school itself, in the second section, I took pictures of some of the teachers' supplies. They, they had big charts they taught off of, and the kids used slates, you know, to do their lessons. And then in the last part, I was going to the old county superintendent. You remember that system? And they took the census of who was in the school and who their parents were. Well, I, I copied those off, and Hank says, well, would you find this interesting? And he hands me a book, and here's some minutes of some of the school board meetings with the bills they paid. And I think uh, one of the years it cost $796 or something to run the school that year. <laughs> Times have changed, haven't they? It's a fun, interesting little book. Well, while we're working on this book, Hank showed me some memories of Rex Dillon, and I'll tell you in a minute who he is, and he lived in California, and Hank wrote him and said, do you remember anything about the Frawley and Anderson ranches? If you do, jot it down. My goodness, he got back a whole bunch of pages, wonderfully written, telling about being a rancher in this part of the country. The hired hands they had, and the, there were some odd hired hands, and the stories of the cattle, and what he did, and, and stories of the Andersons and the Frawleys. And I said, Hank, we really should get this into kind of a book. Talk about the Anderson Ranch and the Andersons, and then we'll <coughs> add this. And he said, okay, do it. Well, every time I'd go over and say, how does this look, Hank? He'd say, well, Mary, what about this? Would this be an addition? And here was another 20 pages I had to write. It was wonderful. Well, this book was supposed to be done six months ago, but he kept giving me more and more information and saying, is this anything? And so the book has turned out to be 230 pages. I don't have it. The printer is ill. It was supposed to be done Monday. The printer is in bed, so he didn't get it done. I'm going to drop that. This is what it will look like when we get it done. And I'm going to kind of go over the sections in it. If you, how many of you are acquainted with the James Anderson place? Do you know where it is? It's just past Whitewood and it's those stone buildings off, kind of tucked into the mountain up there. Well, that's Hank's great grandparents. And James Anderson came, we thought, in 1877 out. They lived in Yankton. He had married another Danish immigrant, and they had one daughter, Christina, and he decided to come out on horseback and 
see what was out here, and see if he could start a dairy ranch out here. Well, sure enough, he found a year-round running spring, went back to Yankton, got his wife. They loaded four covered wagons and brought to start it out on the trip. Now, everybody in Yankton, and it wasn't Yankton, it was a little Danish community just north of Yankton called Lakeport is where they live. And everybody said, you're not going out there. Because remember, the Battle of Little Bighorn was 1876. So this part of the country was considered pretty dangerous, and it was very well publicized. Well, as we started doing research, we discovered James Anderson came out in 1876. And that's when he found the land and established the ranch. And then he went back and got his wife and children. Well, as they were getting ready and they got a cattle herd, a small cattle herd ready to go and some uh, horses, everybody said, all the young men wanted to go see Deadwood, <laughs> wanted to find out what this place was all about. So can we ride along? And of course, the Anderson said, sure, but you got to work. So they came out with quite an entourage of these guys that were tagging along, and they helped them get here. And they established this ranch. Now apparently, there were quite a few people that were helping them because they built a barn, chicken coop, house, and when Catherine, Mrs. Anderson's brother, Hans, Tybo came out the next year, he had a cabin he could stay in. So they were really building for a while. James Anderson started taking a buckboard full of milk up to the mining country, Deadwood and the rest of them, you know, Terrytown, Elizabethtown, all those little towns. And he would have to stay overnight. Now those of you that remember driving horses, I don't, will understand that if you leave the Whitewood area, with a full load, whether you're driving mules or oxen, it'd be pretty tough to bring that same team back the same day. So he had to stay overnight. And there's some stories in there about what happened to Catherine while he was gone. Well, then she established a vegetable garden and, and had chickens, and she started loading the wagon, and they were making money. Then James was elected to the uh, state legislature the year we became a state, which was 1889. And, but he was sick. So he was taking the train into Chicago and a number of places. They finally determined he had stomach cancer. And uh, that was in 1890. And his daughter was 19 years old. Now I'm sure this dad was worried about his wife and his daughter and leaving him and not knowing what to do. There's no record of how it came about, but in that summer, Christina, 19 years old, and a Lutheran, married Henry Frawley, 40 years old, and a Catholic. Now the big gossip was not the age difference. The big gossip was, oh my God, a Catholic married to a Lutheran. Well, that'll never last. <laughs> and of course it did. Christina was gorgeous a beautiful, strong-willed woman. A few weeks after the wedding, James did die. And I always wonder why they call it the James Anderson Ranch, because Catherine kept the ranch going after 1889. It was Catherine that had the hired men, and she had this big support system, but Catherine was the one that kept the ranch going. And she married a man who lived in Whitewood, and they built the Lane Hotel. If any of you are familiar with Whitewood, that building still exists. It was a very upscale hotel. And her daughter, she sold the ranch to her daughter. Her daughter was married to Henry Frawley, living in Deadwood, but this was her place. So if she had an argument with Henry, she'd just come back to the ranch. <laughs> He'd have to come fetch her again. Well, then Henry bought a place that we know as the Frawley place. And that's the next section of the, of the book. Well, in between there is Rex Dillon. I'll get to Rex Dillon in a minute. So Henry started buying up homesteads to add to his place. And 
Hank took me on what he calls the historical tour of the Frawley Ranch, and it takes you through time. You start out at a dugout. Wolsey Burton was the homesteader, and that information is in here. Then you go to the Carroll Place, which was a log cabin, and then you go to the Grant Place. And I don't know if any of you know about Grant. Um, I think he has a granddaughter that lives in Sturgis. His name was Henry Grant. He was married, lived in Minnesota, and then his um, wife died. But most of his children were older, some of them were married. But he came to this part of the country, Centennial Valley, with two sons. And they worked at a number of different jobs. They all had homesteads. One son had homesteads east of St. Ange. One son had homestead, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And Henry had the homestead where the quarry is uh, on, uh, on 85, as you're going down, that was Henry. They built the Cook City School that we know now on Cook City Road, that stone building. And then he took his boys to Arizona and they brought one of the first sheep herds back to Belfouche. Well, his son, homesteaded a little piece of land west of what we know now, well, kind of west of the school in that area. Exactly how the trade came about, we don't know. But somehow, that land became Hank Frawley's, and this Billy Grant had a place up a little bit north, kind of on I-90 today. And when Hank became aware that I-90 was going to go right through that house, and they were going to demolish it, he talked them into moving it. So the house has been moved, and it's kind of a plush house for those days. It was all wood sideboards. It had a, an upstairs with two bedrooms and a window in each bedroom. And so they moved it to a little canyon, a beautiful setting. And Hank furnished it with a cook stove and pots and pans, and, and the beds are all made. And, and you walk in, and it's like, the Grants just left yesterday. Or they just went to town and they'll be back. Well, after he built the house, not too long after he built the house, he said to his wife one day, I'm going to go into town and take the buckboard and go into town. So he did. And she looked out the window and there he was, sitting there in the wagon. So she opened the door and went out and said, what's the deal? He didn't answer. He was dead. He had been hit by lightning, and he was sitting upright in the wagon. And I found a newspaper report of that in the Aberdeen paper. So Frawley bought that cabin and moved a summer cookhouse with the cook stove out in, an, in another building so it didn't get so hot in the summer, into this little canyon setting, and it's lovely, very nice. And that's one section. Well, after Henry Frawley, the attorney in Deadwood, died, the ranches went to the three children, and they had Henry J. Frawley, which is Hank's dad, William Frawley, and Honora Frawley. Now, the two boys came to their dad one day and said, Dad, we're going to school in Deadwood, and the principal hates us. Well, apparently, Henry, the attorney, had done some legal work that kind of conflicted with the principal's interest and he was taking it out on the boys. So uh, Henry started asking around and a guy said, you know, there's a nice little school back east that boards kids and it might be a good thing for your kids. Now what the discussion was, we don't know. We don't know how Christina felt about giving up the boys. We don't know. but. They did wind up going to this school back east, and they would take the train for free because Henry represented, was the attorney for the train. And the name of the school was Notre Dame. So they went to, uh, and I think Henry was in the eighth grade, and they put him on the train and took him back, and they went all the way through junior high and senior high and college at Notre Dame and then came back. Honora, the daughter, stayed here. She was apparently charming and gorgeous. And there's, so 
some information about her, but she had asthma. And so she was constantly searching for a climate that was good for her. And she wound up going to college at Dominican College at San Rafael, California. Met a guy who had come out to make his living in the gold fields. Didn't make it. They got married and went back to his home in New York. He managed hotels. And if you look up New York hotels, his name's all over. When his granddaughter got married, in her wedding announcement, it was said, she is the granddaughter of Vincent Coyle. That's how famous he is in, in New York. They had two children, and then Honora got ill. But in the meantime, they're back running the ranch, and it was called the Trinity Ranch. Henry, William, and Honora, the three kids, ran the ranch. Henry was in charge of the farming. Bill was in charge of the livestock. At one point, they decided to have Hereford cattle. So they bought purebred Hereford cattle and started selling Hereford cattle with other Hereford breeders. And they needed somebody to represent Honora's part of it. And you might know the name Lloyd Dillon. Lloyd was quite famous as a stockman in this area. He and his brother, Reese Dillon. And I think Reese was active in politics had come out here and had several different operations raising horses, and apparently that was a very profitable business in those days, selling horses to the army. Well, he came into Whitewood, got married, came into Whitewood, and if he was at the livestock barn, and he gave a nod when a cow or a group of cattle came through, they drew a higher price, because Lloyd said they were good cattle. So the Frawleys hired him to represent Honora. So it was Bill, Henry, and Lloyd Dillon. Lloyd Dillon had a son named Rex. And when he was six or seven years old, he started going with his dad out to the ranch. So he became very familiar with all the people at the ranch and how the ranch operation happened. Then the Frawleys decided to have a Hereford sale of their own. And I, don't quote me on dates because my memory gets so bad. But I believe it was 1923, they came into Whitewood, had the whole brochure printed up, and had a Hereford sale. Did very well. They were very pleased with their decision to have Hereford cattle. Little did they know, and we've talked about this before, the weather was changing. One report I read said that we didn't have rain in this area for seven years straight. And and the fields dried up. Everybody, including the Frawleys, had to get rid of all of their livestock. There wasn't anything to feed them. And then the banks crashed. And everybody was borrowing money on their place and then thinking, next year we'll have rain, next year we can make the payment. Lots of people lost their ranches, lost all their cattle, moved off the ranch. Frawleys hung on to what they had. But Henry, by this time, was running the ranch alone. His brother had died, Honora died in California, his mother had gone out with her and then came home, and two years later she died. So now Henry was alone. And sometime during this period, he and some cattle got into a disagreement and he lost. He was in the hospital for a couple of months and broke his leg. And Hank says they never really did fix it. It was always very painful for him and he had to walk with a cane. By this time, Hank had gone to Notre Dame and graduated. And he said, gosh, I, I don't think I want to be ready. I think I'm going to be an actor. So he went to Yale and took some acting courses. While he was at Yale, his folks called and said, Hank, could you come home and run the ranch for the summer? Because it's, it's hard for your dad. Hank said, sure, I can do it for the summer. That was what, Hank, 60 years ago? Long summer. Been here ever since. All of that is in the book. I, I know it's not fair to tell you what's in the book and not have it here. I, I did some table of contents, so you can kind of see what's in the book. That won't help you. I'll have the books next, next week. If anybody's interested, let me know and I'll deliver the book.
Let me touch on one more subject and then I can open it up. My next project is do a, a handbook on using the BLM records that are online to gain information about homestead. As we were going through this, we, we needed to find who had homesteaded what pieces of land. And as probably a lot of you know, you can go online to the BLM website and put in a number of different things and you get different pieces of information. Like you can put in just the last name for South Dakota and everybody with that last name, their homestead will come up on a chart. You can put in last name, first name in South Dakota. You can limit it to a county and you'll know where it is. Or you can limit it to a section. One of the more interesting aspects for me was you can put in the section number and it'll tell you everybody that homesteaded in that section. So you'll know the neighbors of your grandfathers that homesteaded a piece of land. But one of the things I discovered on those sheets, it tells you what law, what federal law, they got their homestead with. My grandparents homesteaded north of Wall. My grandfather worked for the railroad, and that was at the time when the railroad came into Rapid City, and I think that was 1907. So my grandmother moved with four of her children out to this place, and they had what they called a skid shack, and it was just a one small room on skids, and you could rent it and pull it out. And they stayed there over the summer, and in the winter they moved in. Well, the family story has always, always been, Grandma must have lied, because they had to stay on the place for five years and do some improvement. And my grandmother owned that for until she was in her 90s. She wouldn't sell it to anybody. She finally sold it to my dad with the promise he'd keep it, and he promptly sold it. But we, we always thought Grandma got away with something. Well, when I went to look at these homestead records, there was two laws. I called the BLM to get an explanation. Number one was the federal government was looking for money. And they said, we can sell that land way out west for uh, n no less than a dollar and a quarter an acre. Out west at that time was Ohio. So they started selling all of this land, and some of it sold for more if it was bottom land, and I, I didn't get into all that. Well, by the time they got out here, the federal government back in Washington said, Gosh, who wants that wild country out there? That um, Dakotas and Montana and Wyoming, nobody will want it. So they passed another law that says, if you will just take this land, and remember the railroad was pushing them because the railroad wanted people out here. So they said, if you will take the land and settle on it and do improvements in five years, you own it for a $15 fee. Well, come to find out most of the people who settled in this area bought their acreage. So now the question is, if you could get it for free and you knew you were gonna be there for five years, why would you buy it? Why would you pay the dollar and a quarter an acre? Why wouldn't you get it for free? So this handbook is gonna talk about how to find those and I hope to find the answer to that question. I'm going to go back to the BLM and question them, and I might have to go to Montana. That's where the big office is, it's in Montana. Anyway, that's my next big project, is to do that handbook. I, I don't know whether I've given you enough information. There's obviously, I could talk for three hours on the Frawley book. There's so much information in there. Let me tell you one quick story that Rex Dillon tells. He said there was a, a, a hired hand that went out to feed livestock. And usually, when they saw him coming with the wagon, the cattle would run right over. We all have seen that happen. And there was this one old cow that was sitting down, and she didn't get up. And he thought, well, wasn't that hungry. So the next day, he came out again, and she's sitting in exactly the same spot, and didn't get up again. He thought, well, I better go over and check this out. Went over. Someone had killed a cow skinned her, put all the innards in the skin, 
and set it up like she was sitting there. And they say, he ends it with, and the sheriff never did catch the guy. He was probably laughing too hard. So those are some of the stories that Rex Dillon tells in his section of the book. Terribly interesting. He's an excellent writer. Well, tell us more about Hank after he left Yale and came back to South Dakota and didn't go back again. Do you have some stories to tell about? I I left out one section, and, and this deals with Hank, and Hank always just grins when I ask this question. His dad married a lady from Rochester, New York. She was from a very well-to-do family. All of her uncles and her brothers went to college. She came from a very rich cultural background. And I said, Hank, what made your mother come out here? She didn't have electricity, she cooked on a wood stove. Why? He does this. Well then, I look at Molly, Hank's wife. Her dad was a rear admiral in the United States Navy and ran naval operations, the fourth director of naval operations. He was, has, I can't tell you how many medals. They lived in Washington, D.C. and Molly went to private school. Molly met Hank and married Hank, so then I say, Molly, what are these frolly men got? And they all, they both just grin at me. So I don't know what the frolly men have. But one of the things I wanted to make sure I included, we always talk about the men. The men had the ranch. The men set up the operation. Not one of them. And the frollies, I had to all admit this, none of them could have done it without the women they married. So there's a section in the book called uh, The Frolly Women's China. And what I was trying to do is pay, pay tribute to these women and what they had done in this. When Hank came home, he did continue to act in plays at Black Hill State University. Now, how much acting he does today, I don't know. <laughs> A little bit. He's smiling. He's smiling. <laughs> And Hank has been involved in uh, the historic preservation of all of these places. Now it involved a lot of his personal resources and he was able to get grants. And then when it came time to give up the ranch, they knew they'd have to, he was able to find a developer who promised to, while developing the land, as he is doing, and adding some amenities, like the golf course, he would also protect the history. And he has done that. He has made sure that the barns were restored and he got some grant money too. And so Hank has spent 40 years, not only in the Frawley Place, but you remember at one time the wrecking ball was headed towards the Lawrence County Courthouse. And Hank was county commissioner at that time and worked very hard to get that building saved he also won an award for protecting the grass. Uh, most of the place has been plowed under, and you remember the, the native grasses that we used to see whipping out in the fields. Well, if, on some places at the Frawley Ranch, that grass still is there. The native grasses are still there. And he just won an award from the um, Daughters of the American Revolution, and it's the highest award they give for historic preservation for the work that he's done. Wallace has been on the ranch. Is Thank you for asking Thank you. me. Thank you for coming. I, I, I'd love to have you just look at this book and see how it's put together so you would know how to do one on your own and pick any subject. The format will work with anything. We made a few mistakes in when we started, but we finally figured out how to do it right, so if you need any advice. Uh, who did you have publish it? We, we, we didn't. Oh, okay. uh, I just took it to a printer, a printer okay. and had them print the pages and do the binding. Okay. So we didn't have a printer involved. It was cheaper. Uh huh. Sure. And, and we gave these books to every school in uh, Lawrence County. The fourth grade does um, South Dakota history studies, so they all got a book, and all the libraries. So now we're selling it to, to try and gain back our money that it cost us to make these books. 
so we don't put the treasury, which is kind of small. But, uh, but really, uh, if anybody wants to look at it, you are welcome to look at it. And I hope you pick up on the format and have, uh, join with other people and, and put down your memories, high school memories, or proms. Remember the proms? They're not what they are today. They didn't cost us $500 for a prom. No. <laughs> and, and if you put down some of your memories for proms and some of the pictures that you went, anyway, that's it. You know, Mary is so right about writing down a memory and not saying, well, I'm not a good writer. I don't know how to write. I think it's true that if you just write it like you tell her, no. um, each little bit that you save is that way. Now. As I was listening to Mary, I got two new ideas for programs. <laughs> the Sturgis Armory yeah. and the Boulder Canyon School. Yeah. And so maybe we'll see who we could find to research those and, and uh, we'll just keep going. There you go. So anyway, well, thank you for coming and sure, write the memories down. And when you come the next time with uh, Ernie, uh, we'll enjoy his collection. And then the next time, come and, and maybe we'll I don't know. I won't promise petty candy, but maybe we'll find some petty candy around. So thank you. One more thing I want to uh, talk about. I'm trying to talk to the Lawrence County Historical Society into doing a map, and, and we have a, a large map of Lawrence County as it originally was. You know, it was huge. And putting in all the schools. People know about the schools, but we don't know where they are. And a, a gentleman who was raised in just north, a mile north of Whitewood, lives in Sheridan. And I wrote him a letter and asked him for the schools, and he said, sure, I know where three schools are. And he gave me the description, and he said, now, you go up to that oak grove on, on the valley road, and it's about a quarter of a mile from there, you know, just over from the Johnson place. Uh -huh. <laughs> and those are the descriptions I'm getting. So I'm trying to put that together, and at some time, when I get this map ready and I have some information, would it be all right if I came back? Oh, and gosh, some yes. of you might know where some of these country sure. schools mm -hmm. were located, and you can find it on the map for me, so you don't tell me it was just down from the Johnson place. Cause I don't know. And the Johnson place was sold 50 years ago to somebody else, you know, so I, I don't know where the Johnson place is. <laughs> Would your uh, uh, treasurer, county treasurer and all that, or the assessor? No, uh, that's that, the that problem. The records for the uh, county superintendent, you remember the old county superintendent, are in Pier. They are not all there. They're, they're in piecemeal. Now what happened to the other ones, nobody seems to know. And they would make out uh, this census every year with all the kids' names and the parents. Sometimes they put the name of the school. Sometimes they put the number of the school. Sometimes they'd leave the whole thing blank and just sign their name and everybody knew which teacher was at which school. And there's no place that tells you where. Somebody else said, well, just go to the map and you uh, section. Well, there was always a school section. That's not on record either. It is. You can, you can go to the BLM site and find a section and there's always a quarter, you know, the, a little quarter down the corner that wasn't homesteaded. My guess is that was the school land. That's my guess, but I haven't been able to prove that yet. There's no place. Well, I called Pierre and I said, do you at least have a list of schools? Because there's over 77 schools in Lawrence County. And I think there was like 98, but I know over 77. They said, no, there isn't, but you can go through the records. And I said, well, yeah, but man, that's quite a job. And he said, my guess is it would be between five and eight days, <laughs> eight hour days. Yeah. Because there's nothing, there's nothing organized. I mean, they're organized by, and now they put them into districts. Well, there weren't any districts in those days. So you're trying to find out where Centennial School was in that, at what district would that be today? Well, you, if you don't know where it was, you can't find the district. So uh, I'm going to go to Pier. 
I, I'm not going to spend five days in Pierre. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but I, I'm going to go to Pierre and see if I can make any sense out of the records and see what I can come up with. Yeah. What I need is the list of schools and their numbers to start with. Mm -hmm. Then I can start coming to you guys and saying, do you know where such and such a school was? And maybe some of you will be able to tell me where those schools are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.